For more than a century, students in China have been leading the charge for all sorts of causes, like anti-imperialism, democracy and civil rights. And in recent years, student-led groups have become the backbone of the country's queer community. For young people questioning their gender or sexuality, campus clubs are often their first port of call. They're also an entry point into activism. For LGBTQ activism, you usually need volunteers, enthusiastic volunteers, and students and young people are really core central forces in activism. So they are passionate about their identities and politics. They also have time and they're not afraid of different risks. Dr. Hongwei Bao grew up in China, did his PhD in Sydney, and now teaches queer theory and China studies in the UK. He says LGBTIQ student groups started to emerge in China in the 90s, especially after 1995, when Beijing hosted the UN World Conference on Women. The conference marked the birth of the NGO sector, and it also brought lesbian feminists from all over the world to China. Since then, student activists have shown that they're smart, powerful and strategic. They've gotten organised, staging plays and film festivals. They've even sued the Ministry of Education. The visibility of the queer community has been much greater, which is great. Um, but on the flip side, there are more ideological conflicts between heterosexual and non-heterosexual communities. There's been a backlash. A couple of months ago, WeChat shut down dozens of pages run by queer campus groups. The sweep affected clubs at Peking University, Fudan, and even international schools like the University of Nottingham, Ningbo. And now, news is emerging that academics at Shanghai University have been told to identify LGBT students and report on their ideological and psychological status. It's pretty worrying. So I get why people put on their sad, serious face when they ask what it's like to be queer in China. They assume it's awful. But actually, when I lived there, I had a really good time. I went to a trans conference in Ningbo, a drag show in Hangzhou, and a lesbian skate rink in Shanghai. I even managed to find a queer cafe in Urumqi. The way of doing LGBTIQ community work in China that people used in the past may not be applicable in today. The work that involves policy advocacy and rights awareness would be harder because of the censorship of media. The thing is, homophobia in China hits different. There aren't really any religious lobbies and there aren't laws explicitly targeting LGBTIQ communities. Most of the time these groups get harassed by the authorities, it's because they're seen as a political threat. In recent years in China, there has been a crackdown on civil society organizations and different sorts of social and political activism. At the same time, there's also an intensified sense of nationalism and patriotism. So a lot of things can be artificially divided into a kind of Chinese or non-Chinese or Chinese or Western lines. As a result, Chinese activists have been accused of being puppets of the West. It's tricky for the international community to support Chinese queers without triggering nationalist backlash. And of course, you have to recognize that uh, this is in a way a false dichotomy because homosexuality, for example, has been in existence in Chinese history for hundreds of years. I think that we need to think about things in a more cosmopolitan way. Um, first, to understand China's history of its diverse genders and sexualities. And second, to see China as a part of the world where international practices are already deeply embedded. I could really feel the impact of all these crackdowns. So many people I wanted to interview for this story were wary of talking to the ABC. It made me question doing this segment and even this show when publicity in Western media doesn't really help Chinese activists. But I still wanted to show you that there is a queer movement in China. It's passionate and resilient and I hope to see it triumph.